first of all, thank you so much for giving up some time today for what is a very timely and topical discussion for us. Um, over the next four weeks, we'll be covering everything to do with returning to the workplace. Um, and it's especially interesting this year, uh, this week, because of the recent uh, surveys released by IBEC and the National Remote Working uh, Survey, which showcased that 80% of us expect to come back in some form of hybrid working. And one in five workers think they're gonna be back in the office in the next three months. And that's despite uh, our Tana Shilly of Radcliffe saying it would be around September by the time we get back to the office. And of those people that are going back to the office, about 49%, so just under half expect a seat per person. And when we talk to people about what they prefer about working from home, it is avoiding traffic, they feel more productive and more flexible and less stressed. So at the back, with that as a backdrop, I think it's a wonderful time for us to have these really important discussions before the return actually happens. Um, and so I'm very happy and delighted to welcome Hannah Dwyer, who is Director and Head of Strategy uh, with JLL here in Ireland, who will give us an overview of and the insights of what she's finding when she looks at the overall property market. Um, followed by uh, the inimitable Mark Anderson from the Food and Hospitality Group, Gather and Gather, who is seeing it from the cold face of when his teams will get back to work, including staffing them, uh, scheduling and uh, opening up the workplaces. So thank you so much guys for joining us and sharing your uh, insights with us today. Um, for anybody who uh, is not within the Ireland Together community, uh, my name is Joanne Griffin. I am a co-founder of Ireland Together, and we are about 1,500 businesses at this stage, networking and collaborating our way through this uh, economic disruption that we're uh, facing every day. Um, so the purpose of today is really sharing insights and just generating some really good discussion about important topics. So with that, I'd like to introduce you to Hannah. Hannah, if you would like to take the stage. Um, and Hannah, will you bring us through some insights, I think, from what you've been seeing in the market over the last couple of months? Yes, now I'm just gonna share my, share my presentation. Good morning, everybody. I hope you can see my screen there. Uh, thank you so much for the invitation to, uh, to be part of this group. I'm delighted to speak to you this morning. Um, just gonna change my screen. Now, there we go. Hopefully you can all see a full screen there, can you? Yep. Brilliant. Um, so I suppose, yeah, as, as Joanne, thanks for the introduction there, Joanne. As Joanne kind of suggested, I'm head of research at JLL. Um, for anyone who doesn't know, JLL is a real estate advisory company. So um, we span across all business sectors. So whether it be agency, investment, uh, valuation, property management, and we also do all sectors. So office, retail, um, industrial, residential, and many others. So I suppose it's my job as head of research to collate all of this information that JLL generates as a business. Um, and from that to come up with kind of market trends and insight from the huge amount of intel, I suppose, that we generate as a business, working with all of the kind of major landlords and developers in the city, and then also occupiers. So this presentation has stemmed from a big piece of European research that um, my colleagues did drawing on um, themes, I suppose, about the future of work. So using market knowledge, a huge amount of surveys and all of the data that we have, uh, we've kind of come up with this piece about how we see the future of work from a real estate perspective. So we're really finding at the moment, we're being asked a huge amount of questions about the future of work, the future of office space, is the office dead? I'm sure you've all seen the headlines. Um, how will we work in the office? What are the market implications? Um, what are landlords doing? You know, what are the building implications? So it's these sorts of questions I'm going to look um, to answer today. So to start with, I mean, remote work is definitely here to stay. The office is not dead, I suppose, is the first point. But, but remote working is, is something that we're expecting to stay. And I think the key question for companies is how it's integrated and optimised um, within their within their company. So I think the pandemic has really provided proof that um, as a concept, kind of working from home can work. Um, I think that the, the pandemic just really ca catalyzed it and escalated it quicker than we maybe expected. 
Um, so I think this, this hybrid future that we're expecting for the office market, it's going to be a mix of, well, some people call it work from home. It's actually work from anywhere. There's no reason you have to be sitting at home, but it's kind of this mix of work from anywhere um, and then also office-based work. So these are some of the questions that came out of the survey from corporates. And there's some of the questions that corporates are really asking us right now. Um, and I think it's, it's the type of questions they're asking themselves when looking at the wider corporate agenda they have and then also their back to work strategies. So looking at this, I mean, I think it suggests that, you know, it's not just about what does this hybrid model mean for us as a business, but I think it's, you know, it's wider questions about how is it implemented, what services would I need, how much is it going to cost um, and how do we go about that change ultimately. So one of the surveys we did was 160 kind of large companies across EMEA at the start of the year. So it was back in February. Um, and I suppose whilst 11% thought that COVID was really going to have a massive and accelerated impact on their corporate real estate portfolio, um, the majority, so 84%, actually thought that they would fall in the middle of this chart. Um, so actually creating a steady rationalization and a, and a moderate impact, really. Um, and I suppose aligned with what corporates want is what their employees want and what their employees are saying. Um, and we do an annual human experience survey. Um, it was it's over 2000 people, uh, well, employees that we ask. And they're really starting to show, I suppose, a change in the work preferences that they have with a greater emphasis really being on work, the workforce and then also the workplace. So these are some of the key stats from the survey. I won't go through them all, but I think some of the key takeaways really are that, you know, in addition to firstly, I think a big point is that we're expecting less time per week per employee in the office. So prior to the pandemic, it was about 1.2 days per week working from home. And we're expecting that to double now to 2.4 days per week. But I think some of the other key trends to take from this are really around a focus on collaboration, socializing, flexibility, both in terms of schedules and space. Um, and then also experience. And to me, they're, they're the things that really are emerging for the current workforce. Um, so I think a hybrid model for working in the future is really where we're heading. And actually, it's not the future. It's right now. And for anyone who joined early on in the call, we were talking about when we're all going back to the office. And it's actually probably sooner rather than rather than later. So looking at this hybrid model and all of the of the people or the employees that we surveyed, 24% actually want to work exclusively in the office. 26% are keen to work exclusively out the office, but it's this middle ground, 50% are wanting to work it's, um, kind of with this hybrid approach. Um, so that's really where we're seeing most people fall, well, the mix of working from anywhere and then also working in the office. I think when is a really big question and it is one we asked 68%, it's not on this slide, but 68% of corporates we surveyed back in February said that they expect 50% of their workforce to return to work by the second half of 2021. So I think most people on this call would probably probably agree with that. Um, so I suppose looking at this hybrid model for working, we've actually developed a spectrum so it's got kind of all the different types of companies and where they sit, spanning from, I suppose, those that want um, the exclusive office work to others suggesting actually 100% work from anywhere policies. But broadly, what we're finding is that most companies are falling in the middle. Um, so falling within this hybrid mix of office and, and remote working. Um, just some examples, I mean, HSBC came out and said in the UK, they're making um, 1,200 staff permanent work from home contracts. And then on the other side of that, Goldman Sachs actually, I think, called um, the working from home model an aberration and, and suggested that it doesn't actually suit with the culture of, of their business at Goldman Sachs. So you've kind of got these two extremes and then most companies falling in the middle. But I think one thing that really is important is I think no matter where the companies fall on this spectrum, I think the real estate and buildings um, within which these companies sit is ultimately going to have to change and transform and adapt to meet these changing requirements. So that leads on to the next point, I suppose, how I, suppose, I am in real estate. So how, you know, how is this going to change buildings? How are they going to transform? And I think I think the workplace of the future, based on what the survey results have said, I think it, it's going to change really from allocating more space to individuals 
um, and more space for in innovation, collaboration, learning, socialization, and this key point about employee experience. So we think that what's actually going to happen is um, there's going to be a move away from the individual desk spaces, which currently makes up about 60 to 70 percent of a current office to actually having 50 to 70 percent of the office being used for more collaboration spaces. Um, and I think something we saw probably a positive actually out of the pandemic was, you know, with the forced closure of all of our workplaces. I think it's actually placed a greater value on some of the office elements like the collaboration, innovation, um, culture and brand and people like ultimately people. Um, but I think it's actually now starting to place a value on that. And I think companies are really now being forced to think about space. Um, over and above just real estate being a simply, you know, simply being a building for people to work in. It's, it's kind of thinking about um, real estate being much more than that. So um, when we say social spaces, what do we actually mean? So we asked our respondents in the survey to list. Um, so this is the types of spaces that they thought would boost their experience in the office. Um, and these are some of the top results now. Yes, you know, the socialization space, the coffee areas, the lounges, the terraces, stuff like that, you know, that is kind of, of, of huge importance. But I think it's also, you know, good to see on this, the emphasis placed on equally creating areas of focus and concentration and creativity and collaboration in terms of brainstorming. So, um, you know, spaces, people aren't just looking for bean bags and coffee machines, you know, it's, it's looking at other things over and above that too. So I suppose these changes kind of moving towards a, a hybrid model are really forcing companies to think about space and how, you know, how they drive space. And I think a key point is probably around seating densities and, and how a relaxation and seating densities is, is going to change. Um, I think we're not expecting density within offices to tighten back to levels that we saw pre-COVID. Um, now, I do think it's probably going to differ by industry and geography, but I generally think that people within buildings are actually going to have more spaces now. Um, and I don't think, you know, there's been headlines around companies reducing space. Now, there's equally companies that are increasing space. But I think what you're going to see really is most businesses just looking to maximize the existing space that they have. So I don't think there's going to be any kind of fundamental impact on the real estate market but i do think um how people approach the buildings that they are kind of operating and i think that definitely will change um and i think that does lead on to the previous point i was making about having areas of greater collaboration in the meeting room space and you know video rooms and things like that um i also think you know it's also worth thinking about peak usage so it's probably no surprise that monday and friday are the far most favored days to work from home and so how do corporates approach this? I mean, do you start to force staff to work certain times or do you actually just start to look at your real estate and, you know, how that can be adapted to support the flexible flow of workers coming in and out of the office throughout any week um, as, as we are expecting? So, you know, that there's probably there's probably an element of that as well. Um, and I think finally, you know, something that we're clearly, really clearly hearing actually from conversations with corporates is around office design and the need to support their overall business strategy with kind of the, the best in class all around worker experience within within buildings. So um, yes, in-house amenities, green space, health and well-being. But I also think, you know, the race to zero carbon is also going to intensify anyone I speak to. Sustainability seems to be a huge focus for their business in terms of ESG and the CSR agenda. Um, I think tech has really been changing the way we've gone about business for the last decade, but, you know, the, the pandemic catalyzed it. And I think occupiers are really now looking for the best technology and applications, not just within their buildings, but in the future to allow these hybrid connections outside of the office as well. Um, I don't know if anyone saw in the newspaper a couple of weeks ago, there was an article about um, the Salesforce Tower in Spencer Dock. It's actually the greenest Salesforce Tower in the world. And uh, it was in the news because it had secured a 100% score from wide, wide score, um, which is kind of the rating people use for, for digital connectivity. So I think this is kind of where we're heading. Um, I think all of this is really going to form the basis of new office usage and footprint. And it just kind of highlights some of the, the key areas that we're finding companies are, are placing an emphasis across EMEA. 
Um, and I think, you know, as corporates do place that em emphasis on buildings, I think that ultimately does have an impact on um, office space within Dublin. And I think, you know, if your business strategy now starts to think more about employee experience and the demand for higher quality, efficient and smart buildings, that ultimately suggests that companies are going to now just start looking for the best in class buildings and the best locations within a city. So we're of the view actually that grade A space is going to be, uh, oh, sorry, didn't mean to do that. Um, grade A space is likely to be in the in the kind of the greatest demand um, from a real estate perspective. So companies really looking for the best quality buildings. And a good example of this, and uh, I suppose it's not too far from home for me, but the image on screen is one broad gate in London. It's the new JLL and MIA HQ. Um, I think it's just a really good example of the new generation of assets that are coming on stream. So I think it's location, it's energy rating, which is carbon zero, it's tech capabilities. So it's got a wired scored rating of platinum um, and the wider place making agenda that it has. So you can probably see on that image that it's got kind of, um, you know, amenities in place that allow greater um, interaction with communities and people around it. Um, but I think these key credentials, some of the ones that kind of picked out of this building just really kind of signal the focus that companies are going to be having um, going forward. So, I don't, you know, I picked this as JLL just because it was only in the news a couple of weeks ago. We've only just signed it. But I think it is a really good example of what's happening, I suppose, in London. But generally, we'll probably see that start to start to translate here as well. And then something else I think we can expect um, is an increase in flexibility. And by this, I don't necessarily mean flexibility for the workforce, but I actually mean for companies and the leases that they have with landlords. So um, I was I did a couple of presentations in probably 2018, 19 about the rise of flex, flex office space. Um, but actually 2020 and 2021 are going to be really tough years for that for that industry. So flex operators like WeWork, like Regis, like Dogpatch, um, you know, have all really struggled in the last kind of 18 months. And broadly, we're expecting to see a reduction in flex stock. Um, it was Regis who came out and said um, they're expecting to close 150 centres globally. Um, but I think just a key point to make about this is that for 2020, so for next year, um, we're actually expecting a significant increase in flex space again. So generally on the back of kind of economic downturns, you know, people have lost their jobs. They then kind of become self-employed. So you might start to see SME demand coming back and, you know, flex office solutions are ideal for somebody who's just looking for a desk to rent for a certain period of time. But equally, I think, you know, for larger companies as well, in a, near, in a, in a time of kind of uncertainty, the the attractiveness of flex space you know it's it's highly served it's flexible space there's limited capex you have a short-term lease it gives those companies an ability to kind of de-risk in times of uncertainty so i think the whole flex offering which you know i was definitely talking about kind of three years ago in these sorts of presentations yes it struggled in the last 18 months but i think you know flex and its offering that flex has for companies could be something that we see really grow um, next year. And then I suppose a key question for any business um, is around cost versus value. And this is definitely something that's at the forefront of thought. Um, and I think it's a, it's a really complex point, actually. And I think it is something that does need to be considered. Um, and you do need to balance not just financial performance with cost optimization, but also, you know, the element of needing to align that with the wider strategic objectives that your firm has. Um, so whilst we expect most companies, um, they, they're probably going to be looking to reduce costs, um, we do expect an increase in requirements for investing in high quality, um, highly serviced experiential real estate that employees are seeking. So based on our survey, whilst 87% of executives plan to prioritise cost management as part of their operational capabilities, our research also shows that 50% are going to seek, seek to increase the quality of their real estate portfolios and spaces. So I think it's just really about finding the equilibrium between the two and, and that eventual equilibrium is really going to be the definition of, of success for many. So then finally, just to summarise um, the top predictions I suppose I have for the rest of the year and probably really leading into next year, but um, hybrid, the hybrid model for offices is definitely something that we expect to stay and we expect most companies to kind of to follow and integrate within their within their businesses. 
Um, I think forming part of this hybrid model of different components on which corporates are placing great emphasis in a, in a post-COVID world. I think one of the clearest legacies of the COVID pandemic is going to be employee health and well-being. I think it's now paramount that occupiers think. And I, I mean, I'm not just thinking even about, you know, touchless or contactless equipment within buildings or social distancing. It's more than that. It's about thinking about well standards and wellness and health and well-being for employees. I think the race to zero carbon is really important. Um, I think sustainability has gained and is gaining significant traction um, on ESG agendas. Tech also been catalyzed massively by the pandemic. And I think, you know, occupiers are going to be looking for the best tech within their buildings. Um, I think the forced closure of many workplaces has actually demonstrated value in office elements that we potentially actually overlooked, I would say, or maybe didn't even place value on um, previously. But I think the whole point around cooperation, innovation and culture and people um, is really going to place the emphasis for companies to think beyond real estate and beyond buildings, just being, you know, just a place for people to come and work. And then finally, the cost versus value point, the old adage of cost versus value. Um, I think, you know, financial performance is really important. So is cost, op cost optimization. But I think it's going to be about balancing that and aligning it with strategic objectives. And it's going to be key for, for businesses in the future. So that's a really quick summary, actually, of um, the key trends that we're seeing in real estate. We've done a huge amount of research on this. It was quite difficult to almost summarize it just within the within a 15 minute slot um, but I'm sure there's a Q&A at the end if anybody else has any any questions or anything um, they'd like me to cover then and then I would welcome that. Thank you very much Joanne. Thank you so much Hannah that was actually fascinating um, so many insights into it so some of the notes I took was um, the liquid footprint that is a new one for me <laughs> <laughs> which is meant to kind of show how how I, I guess transient the entire thing is and fluid. Exactly, yeah, exactly. And how flexible a footprint can, can be, you know, and maybe should be. Yeah. Yeah. So that work from anywhere, I guess, also means you can work from any country. And then we get into tax issues, right? In terms of. Well, exactly. I'm married to a guy who does that. So I know that there's many tax implications and, and lots of companies are having to deal with that at the moment. Um, so no, I don't think work from anywhere does necessarily mean working in different countries, but you know, it yeah. could mean working in a hotel lobby or, you know, maybe you're working in yeah, a coffee shop or, you know, it could, it could be anywhere that you want to be. It doesn't necessarily mean that you're sitting at your desk with your laptop, with your screen, with your phone, you know, you can just pick up your laptop and go and work anywhere really now, it, you know, it's, it, it's just changing. Yeah, I mean, that's the ideal. We have, um, I think one of our sessions is going to be focused on wellness, which part of the issue that we have now working from home is we're all sat in a seat at a desk and yeah. we don't move to go to a meeting because the meeting comes to us now. Um, mm -hmm. And if we get into this lifestyle where everything comes to us, so we get everything delivered to the door, we get our Zooms delivered directly mm -hmm. to, you know, the seat that we're in, then we stop moving and we stop kind of being you know, up and out. And so I think working from anywhere sounds like the best approach, just from yeah. a wellness point of view. Um, we did have a good bit of interest around co-working spaces um, because a lot of our members obviously are, are working from those spaces and some of them are running those spaces. So do you have any insight into, you know, what, you know, is it going to be a, a huge bonus and benefit for those as we thought in the very beginning? Um, and what are the implications then? Should they also do the collaboration spaces or should they focus then on just the desk space? I'm not sure if you have any insight there. No, I mean, I think when you look at flex space within any sort of operator, they have the individual desk space and they already have the collaboration space. And if not, you know, there's almost more of a focus on collaboration space over and above when you look at a traditional office. So I think that model was already something that they were doing. Um, something I'm often asked is about, you know, the threats of this to property and a company's going to want to go into flex. And, you know, if you can get a, a one page contract that, you know, doesn't need global approval, or you have to sign a 20 to 25 year lease with an option or with a break option at 10 years, you know, which are you going to go towards? But, you know, I think I think from a real estate perspective, they both kind of sit hand in hand. I think you can have a flex market to support 
some people um, in how they go about business. And I think there's always going to be people that want that traditional lease and they want, they're going to, you know, they're going to want their office space. But mm. I think for work, I think anybody asking the question about, yeah, you know, what, what does this space offer? I think for anyone looking to go into flex, um, you know, it does offer less risk. It offers, you know, a shorter period of, of contract. Um, you've no fit out costs. You basically have, you know, the entire office, around you that you can just kind of lease space as and when you need it um so yeah I'm, I'm not surprised I kind of had questions about flex it was a, it was a huge thing I mean I spent 2018 probably doing about 50 presentations on flex to to different companies you know it was something a lot of people were asking a lot of questions about but I think as an industry it's been massively impacted by the pandemic like people don't want to go and sit in an office where there's people from anywhere you know we've all been hiding in our our own little houses in our attics and in our back rooms or where, wherever it is that we are so I think you know there's going to be a turning point where people want to mix with people again um, I think there's a bit of fatigue about the pandemic so people are going to want to get back into office spaces whether that's the flex model or whether that's into traditional space I think they both kind of work hand in hand yeah and I think the difficult then is you know for a co-working space your business model is built around a certain level of density um, and when that density reduces I guess it's the same as owning a building right any corporate real estate um, when the density reduces obviously your profitability reduces um, so it, it sounds like co-working spaces would do well to have adaptable spaces you know yeah. movable walls and things like that that they can yeah well like a desk a desk and a flex um operator is actually half the size it's almost half the size of a, a normal desk in a traditional office um mm. the the densities there you know are, are incredibly tight so yes I, I totally agree with you kind of that flexibility point um i know there is there's going to be a huge amount of thinking across not just flex but the traditional office sector as well about how you're maximizing densities and capacities within buildings and how you know it's liquid and how it's flexible and how you know it can change to requirements and staff numbers and, and everything else. So I think, yeah, I think there's there's a huge task at the moment of companies looking at how they are using space and how they can optimize the portfolios of real estate that they have. Is there an actual guideline that people are using for density to guide them around how many people should be in a building of a certain size or? I mean, there's, there's a broad, so in Dublin, it's generally a hundred square foot per person. It's generally the guide that we have for traditional space. Um, it shrinks to about 60 when you look at flex. Um, but, you know, I don't think that's kind of been revisited post pandemic. I think it's kind of, yeah. it's kind of a working proce process where people are starting to think about about what that means for the future. Yeah, and it's interesting to see that um, we are moving in so many ways around, away from this profitability model of sweating the assets, you know, packing people into as many buildings, packing yeah. so much work into the, the day. Um, there really is a change happening in the world in terms of how we measure the output of what a business does. Yeah. Um, and I think this is, probably going to catalyze that even further because traditionally you buy an office block or you rent an office block and it's about what you can get done within that space maximizes um, yeah. and now it's more like how can people enjoy that space and how can they work effectively in it exactly and I think something else I only really touched on it a little bit in the presentation but something taking that even a step further something else we're really starting to see is it's not for necessarily just the employees within the building there's also a huge emphasis being placed on placemaking so it's actually thinking about the building not just being a building on a street it's how does that building interact with communities and people and other workers you know in that area so do you have retail space do you have coffee shops do you have seating areas and um I don't know if anyone knows the I put scheme Wilton um down on the canal but kind of the emphasis that they're placing on placemaking you know, and the green areas and just trying to not just having this big block in situ, but trying to entice people to walk through areas and interact with the buildings. That's something else. Taking that kind of point you're making, Joanne, even one step further, that's something else that we're really starting to see as well. Yeah. And then it then the last question becomes, you know, will you be willing to travel from wherever you are to commute to this place 
you know, what's in it for me. But um, exactly. I think a lot of people will be looking to kind of flex their hours as well that they go in and out. Exactly. Yeah. And I think the commuting point is key. Um, what differentiates the office for me? Like, why would I? You know, I was speaking to a colleague um, in London yesterday and he said, oh, I've come into the office. The coffee's brilliant. And it's one yes. button. You know, and then for him, that was just the, that was his one piece of news. I was like, you know, how is it? How is it being in the office? And he's like, oh, the coffee's great. You just click one button and, you know, so yeah. like it, that, that's a silly point, but it's things like that. You know, some of the models that the big tech companies have of, you know, you basically go in, you don't spend a penny all day and get your breakfast, lunch, dinner, coffee, snacks, chocolate, everything. Um, and I know, you know, the, the, the pressure on, you know, on those sorts of companies of employees, uh, working from home and kind of being dissatisfied with the fact that they're now paying for their food and you know being told not to expense their lunch on their company credit cards because that's just not that company's policy um, yeah. but you know it, it is I think there is going to be an element of in, like enticing people back to the office like what's in it for me like not Dublin Dublin is quite a small city compared to other cities across Europe I think that's you know mm. most people don't have a massive commute um, I know some people do but you know in London you can be sitting on a tube for an hour and you can change tubes and you can have you know Dublin is actually quite an accessible city um but yes I do think there is going to be an element of well what's in it for me why should I bother coming back into the office now so I think, I think that immunity piece is important that is a perfect segue then to yes uh, I know <laughs> to I'm hungry <laughs> will you um Hannah will you be able to st stick around of till course, the end yeah okay, of course yeah so and Mark, one, one okay. question. Sorry, um, we are talking about employees. What about clients? Would the clients be willing to welcome uh, any whatever sellers in their own offices? Welcome any what in their own offices? Sorry, and, I any have... any sellers. So, well, to sell something, a face-to-face -face meeting, basically. What is the sentiment from 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 clients having people around in their offices? It means like sales. Oh, you mean at the moment? Yeah. yeah. Sales people. You mean at the you mean at the moment, sorry, just, just to confess, so you mean kind of people coming into the office at the moment and having face-to-face -face meetings? Yeah, with, with clients, so when, when yeah. you have a client and you want to go? No, like not, I haven't come across a huge amount of meetings, to be honest, like I am, I'm actually doing, it's, a, it's an hour version of that presentation, um, I'm currently doing that with clients and they're all being done on, uh, we use Teams, not Zoom, but they're all being done remotely. Um, I mean, we're being told by the government not to go into offices for the moment or to work from home unless it's absolutely necessary so um you know i've met clients for coffees but the coffees have been in stephen's green or herbert park um and i think you know it depends on the client meeting if it's an inspection um you know they they can start to happen now i think house viewings can start to happen now by appointment only so um you know i'm not inviting people into the jail office to have a one-on-one -on -one meeting with me but if it's an essential part of a transaction, whether it be due diligence or an inspection um, or things like that, they're certainly happening. Um, yeah. and, and on our resident, we do residential as well, but people are allowed to kind of go in and see homes now. So um, quite, quite slow, you know, but a lot of people are still kind of meeting via the Zooms and various other things, unless it's absolutely essential as part of, of part of business, then they are meeting. Thank you, Anna. Okay, so I'm I'm laughing to myself as I remember the work we work CEOs com uh, comment this week that only the most engaged com uh, employees will actually go back to the office, and anybody else is just disengaged. So <laughs> um, self-serving point there. So welcome, uh, Mark, to the stage. Thank you so much for your time. Um, I know this promises to be quite a juicy topic. Um, <laughs> So over to it's you, my, take it away. It's in my interest to get everybody back into the offices. So um, I'll, I'll preface that from the very start. And it's really interesting listening to Hannah talk there. And she makes an absolutely, some absolutely outstanding points. Um, for us, when we speak to our clients, um, and just as a little bit of a background, Gather & Gather is a workplace catering company based, based here in Ireland and in the UK. Um, we have some absolutely fantastic portfolio of clients that we work with from in Ireland, from the tech sector to media, to retail, and, and then some, and actually today, I'm actually up in the urban farm, up in Airfield in Dundrum. So um, I'm, I, I managed to get out for most of COVID uh, because we were seen as essential workers and we've changed into retail and various different things as we've moved along. But when we speak to our clients, the language has changed from 
I don't know, last year, this time last year, where there'll never be an office again and I may look for a new job to, oh, maybe they might get everybody back at the end of the year too. And now we're in, we're in lockdown three, that's it. We're never opening the office too. Listen, we need to get people back into the office. We need that engagement because it's, it's really interesting. When you're my age, when you're 50 and you've got kids who are probably growing up and you're probably lucky enough to have a house, maybe a three bedroom house, you can work from home. I can't cook from home. I can't do all my job at home, but I can do an element of it at home. But my son and my, my daughter are 21 um, twins and they can't, as they go into the workforce properly, they can't work from home because all their social skills and all their way of learning how to deal in an office or in my, my daughter's a nurse or, or work in that environment and interact, that's their formative years. And you can't expect a couple of guys or girls renting a three bedroom house in Dublin and all working off a kitchen table to be as productive or be as informed or come up with new ideas if they're being encouraged to work from home. So for us, we've had to read, we, we've, re, we've re, retaught everything. Um, and I'll zip through what I think from a food point of view. So myself and Hannah will have the perfect scenario. She'll have the perfect office and we'll have the perfect food offer for you. And you will all be back and now we'll be talking about COVID anymore. So for me, the future landscape is very different. COVID has shook everybody's core values. Um, it's made us question everything, not just about how we work, but how we live, how we buy, how we eat and everything about ourselves. And for me, um, health is the new wealth. That's, that's, that's the biggest thing for us on how we will adapt um, and how we will move our food program on. Most people uh, are now looking at their own bodies as their own ecosystem. My ecosystem is broke, but there you go. Um, it needs a lot of attention and TLC, but everybody now are going to be looking at health and how they can input and how they can adapt and change given what they know and how they've been affected um, over the last year uh, for 15 months. Um, home cooking has become huge. People's rush back to basics, that comfort food that they remember from their childhood. In lockdown wood, we had everybody making sourdough. Then we moved on to pasta and then we had banana bread. So everybody was trying things that they've never done or never had the time to cook at home. So for me, there was some positives I got out of COVID and that we've seen people refocus on what they do at home. So I don't think workplaces will operate like they did before COVID-19, but that's probably not a bad thing because in some situations it didn't work. Um, so what's the future read and look? For me, um, I never ever thought I'd see Irish people um, buy or order organic food boxes online. It was hard enough to get them to go to a farmer's market, let alone do all of that. But that's really kicked off. Like, and, and that conscious consumers and people want to know that they're making a connection. They want to understand where their food comes from. And they feel that they're obliged now more than ever to support local. Uh, that independent and community-based program where people are growing or whether they're trying to understand how that carrot actually gets onto a plate, what goes into it. And, and the people that are needed to share, uh, sorry, to produce and to grow those things, how, how they're affected and all this. When we, we buy an incredible amount, 92% of our offer would be cooked from scratch in all of our kitchens and sites. So when we're not open, there's a huge knock-on effect for our growers, our our milkman, our bread people, our, our, our butchers, our bakers, all of these people, because they don't have that volume now to sell, so they need to shift it elsewhere. And I don't think people actually really paid an awful lot of heathens to where they were buying food in the past, but think that's definitely uh, changed. So we're seeing much more about ethical food. People are talking about animal welfare, uh, plant-based revolution. Like, I mean, it's not one I'm really, really fond of because I think, you know, there's nothing wrong with eating meat or fish once it's ethically sourced and, and reared. Um, but maybe we just need a little bit less of it. Um, it doesn't mean that you have to throw all that out and we just go, well, plant-based. Because, like, I mean, there's, there's challenges in how we do that as well. I think you're going to see an awful lot more collaboration. Um, so how can we, as a business, support local restaurants or pop-ups and um, or do some joined-up projects? When we opened up in uh, UCD, um, when we opened up in uh, UCD uh, late last year, uh, just before we shut down, we signed up with a, a load of seven uh, new restaurants that we would do residency program on so that we could go and um, bring them into the environment and give them uh, some exposure um, and also work with them so that they could get something out of it. But unfortunately, the students were stopped coming back, so we just had to put that on hold. I think we'll see an awful lot of people do more about education and about ed and the entertainment factor of it. So how can they... Or how can we do stuff to influence people either if they're at home two days a week that they still feel part of a team 
we've done an all, we've done all year for the last year we've done a whole series of um education videos and we've done some cook alongs with some dinner guests uh, where we've sent out the food and people cook along with our with our chefs over zoom or over over teams so all of that has changed um, in the last 15 months that probably wasn't only bubbling along one before that i think a big thing around coffee culture so we would do an awful we would have some absolutely fantastic um relationships with the likes of Tree FE, Ariosa, Java, um, and a lot of small artisan um, McCabe's um, uh, or as producers. I think as, as people, especially, um, it was interesting what Hannah said about going back in to get a coffee. As that's moved along and coffee is no longer in your office and you're not there to drink it, um, we've seen a huge spike in people's uh, subscriptions um, to coffee programs. So um, they will are now buying and trying new techniques at home. They're brewing, they're using their air press, they're using their drip, they're experimenting with new beans. So they're a lot more open now as, 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 as they've become used to over the last year of what good coffee should actually look like and taste like. So we've done brewing programs with them. When we see a chance now, when we go back to experiment even a bit more about that artisan coffee experience from really a cold brew, be it a, even tea bars, like what we can do about really, really good infusions um, and just to widen people's education. Because a big part of what we see is when we go back is how we're going to educate people more. Um, again, people's diets are, have changed. Again, that's, that health is the new wealth. People are now looking at everything from keto to low calorie, to plant-based, to vegan, vegetarian. All of these things are paying a much, much uh, more relevance to people and their choices and how they make and what they decide to eat. So as a company, we need to adapt to that and we need to be able to grow our menu base so that we can incorporate all of them. Now, you're never going to be able to hit everybody, but you need to be able to reference and you need to be able to show that you're at least listening and taking those on board so you can offer some choices along the way. Um, the dark reality. So something that was very big in the States, and I know it is in London, and something that we did about five years ago was this cloud kitchen. So with the before COVID, there was a real pressure on space in these office spaces of where you would put a kitchen. And kitchens became smaller and smaller and output much, much harder to do. So we've seen we've seen something about 10 years ago in the States, I've seen these cloud kitchens form. And then over the last five years ago, we actually built our own. We uh, got a premises, did a shared space with some small independent uh, companies. And we offer a, a central kitchen where we can service a lot of office spaces that don't have kitchen spaces. So you can still have a super food offer cooked from scratch remotely and brought in. And um, so the pressure on space in, in, to the, in, a, in, a, in an office space isn't as much. And um, so we think that's going to be huge as well. And I also think it's going to be for restaurants, if social distancing even relaxes or goes, I mean, how do you produce the same offer? Out of that small kitchen, and um, to keep your um, to keep your office or sorry to keep your restaurant taken along. So we think the least these shared spaces and cloud kitchens will be important, and um, it also allows you to do that click and collect a little bit more efficiency or delivery or do some even retail home packs that you can do from this space that you can deliver without impacting on what's going on in the office on a daily basis. So what does the reopening look like? So as we we've looked at everything, and um, exactly as Hannah was saying every early on. Very early on, these were the big 10 shifts that we've seen. Outdoor space is one that we feel is going to be huge. Now, given that we get about two weeks of good weather in or into the summer, that's going to be a challenge. But even out here in Airfield, now we're building an, a structure on the decking outside the main restaurant so we can incorporate outdoor dining, not just for the summer, but all year round. So that's one thing that we're going to our clients where they've got some fantastic spaces that's never been utilized. Um, and how can we adapt that to either stick a food truck in, do some kind of outdoor dining, make it a meeting space that's a little bit more, um, more structured than just people standing around. Um, so that's gonna be really big as well. Automation, again, that touch the system around how people pay, that's gonna be a very, um, that's gonna be a huge part of what we do. And I do think that's gonna that's, that's going really grow and that's gonna really, um, have a big impact on our food policy, or sorry, our food program and how we do that. So people want convenience, want to know what they can do and make uh, experience, make choices in advance. So that's going to be um, that's going to be important. And again, to go back to what we what was discussed earlier on, when you go to the office, you want to make sure that it's that kind of an experience. So that it's like a treat to go into the office to work. So what can we do around food to make sure that we encourage people into the office 
and also that um, we make it worth our while that when they're in there that not only are they productive but they get a chance to interact enjoy safely um, and have that good feeling going back home that you know I really want to go back to the office and actually in a, interact with my, my colleagues much more. Um, physical office spaces so I, I totally agree with what Hannah was saying earlier on I do honestly believe that we need to make that much more of a community so one of the things that we've looked at how can we engage with schools or universities and get them in to understand how kitchens work and how that, uh, how that, inter how that affects their, their own selves and introduce them to the career of hospitality. But how can, we set up a how can we set up the office space to work with our clients to give them, uh, give that experience back? Um, can, we do things with them? can we do things with growers and uh, farmers to bring them in into the office space to sh so people get an understanding of where that food comes from and what's why it's so important? But also, can we... Can we introduce our own beehives, our own herb gardens, our own poly, uh, poly tunnels into the office space so it becomes much more than just a building and it's an actual living community. So the workplace of the future, again, we see workstations, bookings, uh, pop-up breakfast and lunch with a much more flexible option that can be moved around. Um, the service offering simple menus, people understand. So again, depending on what guidelines and if things move around, that you can shift up and down. Um, a lot more around um, serve as opposed to self-service. So in the past, a lot of our, our stations were either, if it's a snacking station or if it's a brew bar or if it's even service on a, on a lunch, it's self-service, whereas now we're seeing it'll be a lot more of a served offer for people. Um, and again, the, uh, the, the big use of technology. One of the things we're speaking to our clients about as well, especially for those people that are in... Um, working from home and maybe be only in a couple of days of the week. And can we do an online kind of courtier uh, service? So a portal where people can go on and click and collect their grocery service or their meal delivery kits and subscription offers or coffee um, and collect them from, a de from an area that we set up. So they don't really necessarily have to go and do two or three journeys to go to the shops and we can go and introduce some really good local orange produce or organic farms um, or some really good bread into it that they can pick up as well for the weekend or if they're doing something over the, over the weeknights. Sourcing and sustainability. Um, this is a big one for me. Like 75% of the world's foods comes from just 12 crops and five livestock species. That's scary. So for us, it's about going back and looking what we do. Those ancient grains, those forgotten ingredients, how can we incorporate them into our menu um, so that we're making people aware of what else they can use. Um, the infrastructure was broke as regards our supply chains worldwide. So we need to go back and, and understand how fragile that is. I, I read a very, very sad story with a, a guy out in the States who can't even get people to come and work and grow and uh, pack his seeds that he sells online. So there's loads of businesses actually not going to survive this. Um, and, and it's the same in Dublin. Hospitality is on a knife edge here. Um, restaurants will not be able to get the same amount of people back to work because people have gone off and picked up a new career or have just decided, you know what, this isn't for me. Um, and that's the same for people who need to go and pick the crops or people that wash their dishes. So I'm hoping off the back of this, there's an appreciation for those further down the food chain, pardon the pun, who wash your dishes, who wash your tables, who um, do the, the basic parts of the cookery program as, as washing and peeling your veg, that they're so important in this whole um, closed loop situation that people need to understand that, that you know there is a way that you have to pay for food and it shouldn't always be cheap and um, i think some of the big trends that cherish and heirloom so again domestically grown produce and farming is, is going to never going to go away that forgotten group and the use of indoor um, agriculture how we can do stuff whether it be if you're living in an apartment and growing something in a window boxes too and um, if you've got access to a plot of land where you can grow so all of that is going to be relevant and uh, people are going to be much more seasonal as well about what they can do. So that's going to be important. Um, and I think we will get back to that sustainability around waste. I think people probably have learned an awful lot about cooking when they've been at home and about what it takes to make a dish and how they boil and how can they boil better so they're making full use of all the vegetables. So if it's a cauliflower, what are you doing with the leaves? Are you making a kimchi? Are you making a pickle? Are you, what are you doing with the stalks? Is it going into a stock or a, salt or a, a soup? Or what are you doing with a chicken? I can't understand why people boil these cooked sliced chicken pieces, when you can buy a whole piece of chicken, much cheaper, um, a nice orange chicken, roast it on a Sunday, take the breast for yourself if you want, shred the legs, take the toy off, put that up and, and use the bones for a stock and you'll save so much money and you'll have 
you'll have food for two or three days. So I think that throwaway culture will probably be challenged an awful lot more around about people, what they do. And it's about buying what you need, not always what you, uh, what you want. So when we speak to our growers um, who have grown programs, it's not about me saying to them, well, I only want asparagus, rocket and, and, and chard. It's about, well, what are you growing? And it's my challenge is to take that um, and adapt it into our menus. I think the longer term impacts for me, um, I think 85% of adults will want some change to continue after lockdown. I'm hoping that they have just, that, that, that changes around about how they eat, how they shop and how they buy food. Um, I think that's going to be um, a very, I think if we can take some positive out of this last year, I'm hoping that um, people have an appreciation for food and where it comes from and how it gets onto the plate. So I'm hoping that that will, will have, have some, some effect. I think that thoughtful capital, capitalism people still enjoy the good things in life, but we want to be make sure that they make um, make an, an, an impact in what to do and how they spend their money. So maybe not go to the big supermarket or the chain um, of supermarkets. Maybe you can go to the grocery shop or maybe you can go to the guy that makes some of the best sourdough um, and buy some bread from him on a weekly basis. Um, so you seem to support local and enjoying what is a fantastic product. I think the food system revolution, it's going to be local, hyper convenient, but still very, very local. It has to be safe. And um, people will have a lot more questions about traceability and what they do. Um, and I, this, is, this is a big one for me. I, tell, I really, really hope that people that work, that work in the food industry are seen as key workers because um, they're vital um, and they're very much always overlooked in this. Um, but, you know, I mean, as someone that started off his career washing dishes, um, I know what it's like and I've worked my way all the way up to where I am now um, and I've had a fantastic career and I'm very lucky the experiences I have but I do hope people understand that food people and people that work even at the lower end of the food scale um, they're key workers that are really really important and um, I think supply chain is going to be key people are going to go back and challenge again I mean how are we getting stuff so that whole, whole um, carbon tracking um, of your kitchen and how your product is coming in and where you're buying from People, I, I hear people saying, okay, we shouldn't buy avocados. Well, okay, well, what happens? What's wrong with avocados if they're perfectly goodly grown or the system is really good down in Spain and Portugal? Um, you know, but just buy them in the season. Don't buy them all year round. It's the same with strawberries. I can't understand why people eat berries in winter. They're only good in the summer, but they buy them in from Kenya and all of that. So, you know, you really need to go back and challenge your own values and principles around food. Um, and I think the farmer, the fisherman and the butcher have reinvented themselves um, with a newfound power to connect with consumers. And I really hope that builds on that because um, that's really, really important. And that's me. Wow, Mark, there's so much, to, so much to unpack and think about. Thanks so much for that. Um, the one thing that struck me was, again, this, you know, the thoughtful capitalism, that there's this move away from like getting as much out of the animal or the land or anything else um, like that, that, you know, we're moving away toward, to, towards a more sustainable kind of yeah. approach in general. And yeah, it seems oh, to be 100%. happening everywhere. Yeah, like, I mean, I said, like, I said, I couldn't believe the, one of the first things people started to do was order veg online, boxes of organic vegetables, yes. um, or then order directly from, um, directly from a butcher because they knew where the chicken came from. And that was actually really, really heartening because as someone who constantly, not fights, but battles or pushes that agenda all the time about like, food shouldn't be cheap. It should be enjoyable, it should be affordable, but it shouldn't always be cheap. Like, and I mean, I hope there's no plumbers on this, but anyway, <laughs> I'll say this anyway. Your boiler breaks down and you call a plumber out and he looks at it and he says, oh, that's gonna be 200 euro. And, and you know, and you don't question him because you don't really know anything about plumbing, but everybody has an opinion and can cook and everybody thinks they can do it better than everybody else. So they'll always question the price of food. And I just don't understand that. I don't think people understand what it takes to, I, I spoke to Mar Maria in Banning McKenney Farms, who grows this amazing purple sprout and broccoli and cauliflower. And she sat there and agonized for two weeks of whether she was gonna grow for this season coming because she didn't know what restaurants were gonna be open. So she has to, does she grow? Does she plant? Does she do all that labor to grow and plant? Then she sits there waiting for hope in the restaurants and indoor dining comes back so people can buy. Then she has to arrange for people to come and pick, get on the back of a tra of a trailer of a, of a, of a, of a, um, <laughs> and, and pick the stuff out of the ground. Then it has to be washed. Then it has to be graded. Then it has to be packed, and all of that without any guaranteed sales. 
So yeah. why should that be cheap or a boy won't get one free? Yeah, so a relationship I I, with value has just changed completely. Yeah, yeah so I think, I think for me, the big part of our system was broken. Hospitality, I mean, there's an argument is, was it a viable industry in restaurants and hotels given the fine margins when you've got some of the top restaurants in the world saying they're not going to reopen because they just can't afford it. So was the hospitality industry a viable industry? I seen Amanda Cohn, who is one of the most amazing chefs in New York, has a vegetarian restaurant called Dirt Candy, who's gone and said, um, it'll cost her $30 an hour to pay her staff because she has to pay, she wants to pay medical, she wants to pay time off, she wants to pay them a, a living wage and something that they can live in New York. So her prices in our restaurant will have to reflect it. So when people are out there campaigning and giving out saying, oh, we need to have more, better minimum wage and treat our people better, you have to pay that at the end price. So it'll be interesting to see how all that changes. Absolutely, and particularly about what you were saying about the, you know, um, the cloud kitchens and mm -hmm. subscription boxes. Um, and people are so used to everything now coming to them at home, rather than, we used to go outside, right? We'd go out for dinner or we would go, go to the shop. Um, we would go out for meetings, we would go to work. And now work comes to us, meetings come to us, mm -hmm. food comes to us. So breaking that habit is going to be really difficult. I don't know, but, you know, I reckon you're right, click and collect will, will hang about for a long time. Um, but that concierge service seems to be, you know, an, an area potentially of opportunity for co-working spaces as well yeah. to, you know, when I you think about it. why do you go back to the office? I go back to the office because it makes my life easier or it yeah. you know, benefits me in some way. Hannah made a great point earlier around about um, offices and those spaces become a community based. I don't think people under, but it's, it's very easy to make throw away, com throw away comments saying we're going to work from home for the next two years. I totally understand where they're coming from, mm. but do they not understand that that office space then has lost the catering provider, security has been scaled down, people that clean the office, um, people that go in and put the plants in and look after the maintenance. So all of that has changed. But outside of the office, the coffee shop in the corner, that gets sales up in the afternoon and in the morning, the retail shop across where someone goes and buys their cigarettes, um, the, the bar and restaurant down the road where the team go on a Thursday or Friday night for drinks at the end of the week, they've all lost that. So it's not, I, I think it's very disrespectful and I also think it's very challenging to turn around and say, listen, we're great, we can work from home for the rest and it doesn't affect us. But you have an obligation as a, as, as a partner in the community that you've invested in and done so much in to also like, okay, well, how is that going to affect all these other people? So, um, yeah, that's how I feel about it. Yeah, and it's interesting, you know, when Hannah said earlier on about the coffee, um, and Hannah, you feel free to jump in whenever you want here. Um, I was one of those people. I worked in Wilton Place for seven years, and uh, I used to turn up and look forward to my coffee three or four times a day, yeah. and it was the one thing that got me through. And if, if I had, um, you know, if I was feeling under the weather, the barista would make me a turmeric latte and you know <laughs> they were more than just uh, our baristas and that you know when you're not feeling well you would wake up and go rather than stay at home and be miserable I'll actually go into the office yeah, as long yeah. As you're not sick um so how do you create that kind of need to get back again some of it obviously is the coffee the food the concierge service convenience well, I think that one of the points I was making as well was people. Like yeah. one of the big things that has been missing from this whole pandemic is people. And I don't think we should kind of overlook or overestimate the value of actually being surrounded by people. Um, and in a business environment, you know, hearing things in the office, checking in on people. Imagine being a graduate. Imagine starting a new job and working in an office where you've not actually met anyone um oh yeah graduates coming in trying to learn things like think about how much you learn when you started in a company just from keeping your ears open and hearing things and seeing things and knowing the way of the world and knowing the way of the office these guys have come in you know cold essentially and working from home and, and not knowing these things and even earlier on in the call I was just saying I came back three months ago from it was my second maternity leave so even kind of for me coming back to work in the middle of a pandemic and you know, luckily I'd already done it. So I kind of knew from my first maternity leave that wasn't in a pandemic, but I knew kind of what to do and, and various other things. But, you know, it's it's just, I don't think people should be overlooked as a concept for these spaces, whether it be restaurants or retail or offices or whatever it is. Um, 
I think people just want to see people again and talk to people and innovate and collaborate and work together. So I think it's that whole casual collision where someone from finance is sitting down having lunch and someone from, I don't know, um, people or, or procurement is sitting there going, Jesus, I had to deal with all this again. They go, oh, well, why did you do it that way? Oh, well, we just, it's, that's how problems get solved. That's how innovation gets, that's where ideas come from. That doesn't happen over, even though this is really nice. That doesn't happen over Zoom all the time. You know, um, <laughs> so I just think things, and I don't think we should be afraid to go back. I mean, because otherwise, what else are we going to do, live there in fear of? Like, we need to be brave and we need to be safe and we need to be respectful and we need to be cautious. But we should be brave. That's what we are as a species. We're brave. We should be out challenging. So we need to find a way to fix things and we need to find a way to do things better. That's that's what I feel. Yeah, I think you're I think you're right. But a lot of us are kind of wondering, you know, wallowing around in uncertainty, wondering, what do I want from my life? Because the old that's a whole life- different call, Joanne. <laughs> You know, you have to make those decisions. Do I actually want to go back to work? And some people are, I guess, um, outsourcing that decision to their employer and saying, well, I'll just wait and see or wait and see what the government do or what legislation. But yeah, I think that herd mentality. Um, I think we've all learned that no one has the answer this time. Yeah. Um, there's very few them. governments that cover themselves well in this or organizations. So listen, um, I was very lucky. Um, I got my first vaccine shot the other day. Um, so... I just feel that we need to go and embrace and get back to do what we do well um, and just be respectful of other people around us and manage our boundaries and all of that. But we can't stop doing what, what made us all really good. Yeah, 100%. Um, Scott, you have your hand up there. Do you want to unmute and ask a question? Yeah, thanks, Joran. Hi, Mark. How are you? Um, How are we doing? Oh, really, really good. Really good. I love my cooking and I love my food and I've got a sourdough starter in my fridge like oh, most, like most other people <laughs> and um I just wonder we talk a lot about hybrid restaurant stuff right I'm oh, sorry hybrid hybrid office and hybrid working and the one thing that I've really seen and, and we had a situation a couple of weeks back where we happened to get an Oliver Dunn uh finish at home box and an Alta box on the same day as presents for our birthdays the Alta box was much better but don't tell Oliver Dunn Oh, I know Alta very well. I know the lads very well. Alta's off the charts. If anybody wants to treat themselves to a nice dinner, Alta dot, altabox.ie. It was they amazing finished. balls. They and it had cold them. red and it had cold red wine. Weird. Anyway, that wasn't the question. The question is this. Do you think that in the way that we're talking about hybrid offices, we might end up in a place where we've got hybrid restaurants? Because it strikes me, I live near Hoth. All the restaurants in the whole seem to be flying, you know, doing takeaway cold stuff that you reheat and takeaway hot dinners and stuff like that. Do you think restaurants end up in a place where they're doing kind of hybrid as well, where maybe two nights a week they're open as restaurants, but maybe then maybe two or three other nights a week they're still doing that takeaway thing? Has that opened their eyes to a different way, do you think, think of doing business? I think especially, especially the higher end restaurants have had to reevaluate uh, what they do. And they will have to do that even more, more so as this comes back. So if you've got... A Michelin star, Red M, those kind of um, those kind of level restaurants. The amount of labour that takes to produce that offer and serve it is off the, it's ridiculous. And um, you're not going to be able to do that now. So they've had to go back and reevaluate. But but the other question I would have is like, I mean, even as individuals, like, and I'm guilty of it myself. The amount of times that I uh, ate in some of the top restaurants in Ireland last year was, or before COVID was ridiculous. So instead of it being a treat, it was ridiculous. So to go back to your question, I think the good chefs will probably say, okay. Maybe, maybe Friday, Saturday or Thursday, Friday, Saturday, I'll run my restaurant. Um, and maybe, maybe like a bit like the guys in Forest, I'll open during the day um, like a farm shop, like we did in Airfield. And I'll sell some of the product that I make during the day for people to take home and cook at night. But if you really want, and then at the weekend, when you want to come out and dine, we'll be open then for a restaurant then at night. So I think that will, that will definitely take, um, take pressure off them. But I do think as well that, I've, I've been saying this for even before COVID. People and people that run restaurants need to understand why they do it. So, for too often in Dublin, especially, uh, people just compete against people just because. Oh my God, they're doing pizza down the road. Well, we better do a version of pizza. Stick to your values. Stick to your principles. Stick to what you do, and make yourself known for that. Instead of open five days, open four days, and give your team three days off, and just get them working four longer days. So you've got a better, more harmonious, got a better culture in your kitchen, and you'll have less churn and people turning over. So I think they'll have to totally go back and look at what they do. Do we do too much in the menu? Can we do less but do it better? Can we just become known for that one thing or those that that? that? So I do think, yeah, I think we're at a unique point that if we go the right way, we'll have a better food industry in Ireland. But um, 
Am I convinced that will happen? Yeah, mm, jury's out. Thank you. Yeah, really interesting. I didn't get one of those bake at home boxes, but I did do the banana bread. <laughs> and I did buy a pizza oven. So, yeah. So did I. Yeah. Altabox, altabox.ie. I'm just going to leave that there. I, I'm not involved <laughs> in the finished. restaurant, but I'm just going to no. leave it out there. I don't Alice think they're doing done. them anymore. No, I don't. Yeah, I think they finished, finished last they finished. week. Did they? finished. They finished. Yeah. Oh, yeah. my God. This is the worst news I've had all day. <laughs> Interesting. They've actually looked and deployed for planning permission to put a restaurant on the top of the car park. I think it's Trinity Car Park. Oh. Um, so that they could do it in a much more open space. So I think the clever guys are now looking about, okay, where do I open or what can I do so that I can have a bigger space or more open? So if something like this happens again, I have a lot more cover. Yeah. That's interesting. But then if we're outside all the time, you know, the weather is just really working yeah. against us. Dress for the weather. You just dress for the weather. Yeah. I've definitely I've seen my brother in uh, New York and New York was open outside, you know, and a lot of those restaurants in New York, they're right up to the pavement. You, there is no outdoor space, yeah. but they had people huddled all over the place and their jackets and their burners and, you know, people still went out and socialized. Um, so like you said, maybe it's time we just figure it out, get on top of this. Cool. Um, one of the things you mentioned, uh, Mark, was having a refocus on home life um, and the fact that people might be more you know, connected with what's going on at home, um, what their needs are, how they feed their ecosystem in terms of health and wellness. And we'll be discussing that, I think, in our people section uh, in a couple of weeks. But what's your take on how do you bring that? Because your business is actually going back to, you know, the hospitality sector and delivering that to people. Um, how do you work that into your strategy? Um. Oh, that's a one. As you regards like what people are doing and how they do stuff at home. Yeah, I mean, do you think that at some stage there will be like um, a home delivery service for the people who are working from home or will they we expect to like take their dinner home with them? Yeah. Or whatever? So we have an element of that. We, um, at the start of the year, we moved into doing some dine at home meals that we cook from scratch um, in our central kitchen that we've now done some stuff up in airfield. So taking the produce out of airfield and turn them into some dishes that people can take home as well um, and cook. But I do think there's going to be a little bit around education. So we're looking at, okay, can we, can we look at ways that we can send out these raw ingredients along with a recipe card and then you zoom in and we'll cook along with you and teach us how to cook. Yes, so I think, uh, <laughs> I think for, for, for me personally, it's a bit big, a big part I want about food is education. Um, and if we yeah. can make a form, I think um, we can work that. One of the chefs that we work very closely with, J.P. McMahon, down in Galway, has um, he sold out, I think, two or three times now his kids' cooking class at home. Um, and it's amazing to see because it's absolutely scandalous that we don't have anything around cookery lessons or mm -hmm. teaching kids how to cook in school. So um, chefs have had to take this on ourselves. So I think from an education point of view, it's all well and good. You get a fabulous box from Alta and all like that. And I'm sure, and they're amazing. But um, I do think like there's a big gap there for people like, okay, listen, how am I going to feed my family this week? And I haven't got time. Um, yeah. or is, there, is, is convenience the way or no, do you know what? I'll show you how to make a lovely chicken, wild mushroom and leek fricassee that you can serve with rice or you can double up the batch and tomorrow you can have as a side with a baked potato or you can leave some in the fridge and someone can cook off some pasta. Um, and you've got three meals there for the week um, and you change things along each way and you know I mean it works so I think education is going to be key yeah absolutely and you said earlier on um, what was it you said about um, I'm trying to think I was thinking of something that would have been stuck on your fridge oh it'll come back to me <laughs> anyway um, the, or the opportunity to deliver organic food do you think that one is here to stay too Yes, I do. I do. Yeah. We see it in the farm shop in the farmer's market in Airfield. Um, there's a real interest on a Friday and Saturday for people to buy that produce to bring home and cook with. Um, I've seen lots of, lots of the growers have now set up and have become quite savvy around tech about how to promote and sell their product. Um, the, the challenges, logistics, how you do that um, and still make it affordable. But if you're getting a really good quality product, I, think that, I don't think that's going to go away. I think 
there's nothing wrong with going to a supermarket. I'm not, I'm not adverse to it myself. But like, if you really want good produce and you want to know where it comes from, buy direct. It's the best. Yeah. And Hannah, in your insights, when when you look at polling people about what's in it for them when they come back to the office, is that concierge yeah. thing coming up in terms of you know make my life more convenient? Um, that almost going to the office is more. Uh, inconvenient going to the office is more convenient than even staying at home to offset the commute absolutely yeah yeah and I think it comes back to that kind of enticing point of you know what's in it for me um yeah the whole amenity space like in our in the London office not the new one that you just saw there we've only just signed a deal on that but um in the one we current we're currently in in Warwick Street um you can connect via an app on your on your phone or there's touch screens ipads on the wall and you can order a coffee and someone will bring a barista coffee to the meeting room that you're in um so it's even stuff like that like i don't have a magic bell that i can just bring my husband and he brings me a coffee or something you know so um yes i think that kind of whole immunity piece is key and you know whatever it is whether it's you know the space to you know to get away from the house whether it's you know space that you don't necessarily have well, I mean, well includes so many different things. It's about light. It's about air quality. It's about access to kind of a water tap. You know, there's so many things to do with that. It's not just um, coffee and bean bags. And is there a yoga class on a lunch that I can go to? And and things like that it includes so many other other bits. Um, just to link in as well, I, I didn't want to bump in over Mark, but we did. As I was saying at the beginning, like we don't just do offices. We do all the different sectors. We actually produced a report as well about the impacts of COVID on the retail industry and specifically kind of restaurants and food services, which was really interesting. And just um, some of the key points that jumped out about that and to draw on some of the points I was talking about, but the emergence of sustainability within retail as well, that it's not just an office thing. It's also an industrial, it's in residential, mm. but, you know, from a retail perspective, say the likes of ASOS, their delivery bags are now recycled. Um, coming back to food, I think, not to mention the dreaded word, but I think, um, who is it? Starbucks, I think, use uh, recycled straws now and things in their companies and um, in their business. And, you know, that, that kind of whole sustainability point is emerging outside of other sectors, not just office. Um, something else, I don't know, Mark would probably know more than this than me, but kind of the emergence I think we call it um ghost retail um just kind of off-site um retail spaces that companies you know your kitchen might not be big enough in the restaurant to deliver large-scale kind of um delivery food products so there's been a kind of a bit of a change and take up across Europe of companies taking larger kind of units in the suburbs where they can make food, um, which then enables them to live to deliver on a larger scale than they can currently operate mm -hmm. on outside their restaurants. So I think the, the kind of this whole, but not just to link it into real estate, because that's what I do, but kind of, you know, there, there are kind of implications as well outside mm -hmm. of, of what Mark was talking about and the kind of the wider implications that that would have. Yeah, I'm just thinking about the implications that fall out from that in terms of just traffic and locations and logistics. And uh, it's just incredible, isn't it? I mean, uh, I've never seen the DPD driver drive up my road so much than I have in the, in the past kind of 10 months. You know, <laughs> it's practically like we have a personal driver up and down every day. Um, do we have any questions from the audience? Otherwise, I will go back to the Q&A here. Anybody got a hand up? No. Okay. Let me yeah, go. To uh, sorry, Joanne. Yeah, I just um, oh, go ahead, Mary Finn here. Um, just a question for Hannah. I did put it into the chat, but um, just um, on the the whole return to uh, to spaces. Um, so, what are do you have any ideas on uh, locations that would be used for training and in person training events? Um, you know, whether they're small or, or, or larger groups. I know you said earlier on that the protocol still says, even though it was revised at the weekend, um, for people to stay at home as much as possible and meetings aren't happening as much in person. But, you know, just in um, just looking at training events and, and venues and locations, do you have any thoughts or what, what are you seeing out there for those kind of events? Well, like at the moment for us, 
kind of speaking from a personal experience, like I obviously work for a big corporate company. So in terms of what we're doing, like any training we have is being done remotely and it's being done online and kind of preparation of returning to work. And I'd say most people um, are the same. And I think when people get back into their offices, that's ultimately going to be done in the office. So um, as a business, I mean, we're not necessarily looking for offsite venues of where training could happen. That, that That's not really something we're doing but I think um yeah for the moment the training is almost happening prior to returning to the office so it's kind of getting people geared up and ready for that return to work before it actually happens so at the moment anything I've come across anyway um has all been done online really and whether it be a a guide that you read or somebody talking to you or you know a presentation it's it's all kind of still at, at the moment anyway being done online and even thinking about some of our other kind of corporate offices around the world. I think that's that's still the case outside of Ireland as well. Okay, thank you. And folks, I think Mark, you need to run. So um, I need to go and take lunch. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So go and prepare whatever you need to prepare, feed the masses. And thank you so, again. Thank so you so much. much for having me. I hope Thanks you got some rumblings. <laughs> yeah, great with feedback on your presentation. So really appreciate your time. Thank you so much. Best Hannah, of luck we with might this. just thank you. We might just run through some of the Q&A quickly, uh, see if some of this will uh, resonate with you. So um, first of all, there's a lot of great things to say about your presentation too. So thank you so much. People are loving the insights. Um, let me see now, a little bit about cooking. The city coffee shops. Um, I love cooking. <laughs> I'm a closet chef as well. But uh, anyway, no, go on, let's focus on real estate. Master chef. We might, Sorry, we might see you on MasterChef one of these days. Oh, well, <laughs> we'll see. You know, in the retail sector, and um, there's a lot of, uh, co you know, companies or or institutions that have had like a shop front have been wet, very well looked after. So they've had um, their tax warehousing and their council rates reduced, and some of them have had, you know, rent forgiveness. Um, what do you think will happen? The the shops with the shop fronts in you know over time particularly when you think of Dublin city centre has there been any discussions around that um what sorry just so I understand what you're saying in terms of post-pandemic how they're changing post -pand just yeah been... when they need to get back to you know to full speed will they open up again or do you think some of them will just die out yeah no well yes to both of those points I think um I think the second retail is allowed to open up again for those stores that haven't actually closed in the last 18 months which unfortunately has been some retailers um but I think they will be looking to open up shop as quick as possible um and we'll be using store windows and various other things to kind of get people back in but I'm, I'm not sure that's going to be an issue um based on some of the headlines coming from pennies and booking appointments and various other things. I think people are kind of keen to get out and, and not have everything delivered by their personal delivery driver on their road, um, who I'm also on first name terms with. Um, but no, I think, yeah, I think, you know, retail has been massively impacted. It was only really starting to come out of the last recession um, when this unfortunately hit. It was kind of slower than, say, offices and industrial um after the last downturn so it, you know it was really starting to kind of prosper again and then it's been hit with this which you know closures are closures like there's nothing you can do about that they've just been closed for for an incredibly long period of time um i think there's a wider piece i mean people ask me a lot about online pressures and retail and how um you know how retail is going to be impacted by online shopping um, and I think, you know, that was something I was talking about prior to the pandemic anyway. And what we really saw was retailers who had physical stores, so bricks, had kind of navigated towards having an online presence as well, which we call clicks. So this kind of clicks and bricks um, or omni-channel retailing. Um, so having kind of avenues in both was something that was really important. Um, and I think that's still the case now. I think, you know, for anyone that's survived well in the pandemic they've had that online presence and, and clicks rate and to kind of keep them afloat but I think something that's really interesting that's also emerged is some of these retailers who actually solely have an online presence um, they're now looking for the BRICS presence so they're now actually looking so okay we're a solely based online business how do they then actually get on the high streets or in shopping centres because you know 
having a brand out there, having a store to go into, having that experiential retail experience is actually really, really important. Unlike, you know, something that people haven't been able to do. So I think that's really important too. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of stories that say that's how Apple was such a success, right? They positioned themselves as a luxury brand and you went into an Apple store, not really to buy a phone because you can do that anywhere, but you went in for the experience. Um, yeah. And so I presume that retailers are also thinking about, you know, from the from the consumer, the shopper going into their store, what's in it for me? Why shouldn't I just click and click and have it delivered? You know, exactly. I think it's Vans. I could be wrong, but I think it's Vans and um, the kind of skateboard shoes company. They have um, a museum in New York. So it's not actually a shop. You just go in and look at trainers. Um, so, you know, that's the ultimate drive in this experiential retail point that you know it's about getting people in the store looking at things feeling things talking yeah. about it in this new culture of instagram and you know young people wanting to take selfies and photos with products and being able to scale it using um kind of different channels of media is you know it's a really important point and i think it's one that helps brand massively for these retailers and you know amazon is probably one of the biggest online retailers and even they've kind of gone into the the store model they've opened stores um in the us as well mm. where you can actually go in and buy products in a physical shop like in a physical brick store it's not just all online now so i think i think the point is about this kind of omni channel you know the store is really important but i think online is really important and i think the two just need to try to work together yeah and i think that's a key takeaway for everybody today is that the, the future is about experience so even when you go to a restaurant it's probably less about the food you're eating even though you know you want to eat good food but it's about the ambiance the experience how you're treated when you get there the fact that yeah. you don't have to tidy up you know and that you feel well it depends where you get your food box from for some of them i feel like i use every pan in the house but um <laughs> No, like I certainly feel like, like I, I love my food and I think I've eaten every food box going there is in the last 18 months, but I don't feel like I've missed out on gourmet food. I feel like I've had that hit by having my cook at home kits, but something I have missed out on is actually meeting people in restaurants and, you know, going for a G and T beforehand or, you know, seeing people in the restaurant and saying hi. And I think it's that bit in some respects, it's not the actual food because I've had that I've had, you know, the Forest Avenue, the Bastables, the Altars, the, you know, all the nice ones. But um, yeah, it is. It, it comes back to that experiential kind of high. It's almost like a hybrid point, you know, hybrid and, and, and experience as well. Yeah. And we've actually got a couple of virtual reality companies uh, here on the call with us. Um, I know David has been working in uh, giving people 3D tours of virtual rooms. And Stephen, I think, is here as well, who um, runs a virtual reality meditation. So everything is moving towards, you know, experiences, isn't it? It's just, um, but I don't know, virtual experiences. Do you, David, do you have any feedback in terms of, you know, what has that done for some of the clients that have tried it out? Has it been mostly like showing around real estate? Yeah, Joanne, right. it's, um, there is a lot of it in the real estate and, as Anna would know, in property tours. Um, for myself, I've been kind of across a lot of different sectors. Um, a lot of showrooms in the last few months where even from the, the whole idea, if they were open, they were on restricted appointments or restricted access, um, people not being able to travel. So it, it also opens up a, a wider network. So um, tile and bathroom showrooms and kind of distributors as well at the distributor level, as well as the consumer level. Um, education, schools, um, university, um, creches, you know, one particular creche. Um, she was trying to fill her classes for September, 2020. Um, and obviously couldn't have parents come and visit in, in person. Um, so that worked really well for her. Um, and yeah, it's it's also then with the, with the type we do, um, you can embed it with your, your existing content, video, your sound clouds, um, the chain of gyms in particular did that, use audio and video, uh, welcome messages. Um, and again, linking out, you, you can link it down to your e-commerce pages. And actually, and you're not depending on a website, so you can send a, 
an easy distributable link in a WhatsApp message or a text message. So you can interact directly. Yeah. I think it's interesting just to see that the trend is there. People want to interact. They want to see, they want to touch it. They want to feel it. Um, and we're trying to figure out how can technology get around that. But then when we, we need to get our lazy backsides off the chair and actually go somewhere, then we kind of stop and go, well, what's in it for me? You know, well, why do I need to go outside of the house? And I think that trend, um, that seems to be permeating. Retailers, properties, workplaces, um, and even, you know, restaurants and, and pubs. I mean, at least with a pub, you know what you're going to get. You're going to get the ex exact same drink or near enough, but you're going to be with your friends, right? And you're going to get the ambience and you're going to get the fun that comes with it. So uh, I don't, I, I wonder will the pubs bounce back? Um, do we have any more questions, guys? Because otherwise I suggest that we might wrap it up a little bit early and give everybody some time back. I would, sorry, John, I would just mention on that, just VR and, and augmented reality is just going to have such a huge impact in this area. You know, we, like we ran a, a meditation event for about 25 or 30 people in VR um, on Sunday night. You'll have people, you know, they won't need to turn up in a store. They'll turn up in VR and they'll compare dresses and watches and iPhones and, you know, they'll do that virtually, you, you, you know, in two, three years time. You join a company, you'll get a VR headset, which will have in it all the training policies, you know, all the workplace things, you know, the the route of how you you work through the building to go to the training space. You know, it's 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 going to have a huge impact because it is such, you know, it's three D Zoom and and it brings people together in a way that you have to experience to to understand it. But once you have that, and you can almost literally touch and feel the clothes and the product and the your the person you're talking to in the meeting room it's another reason to stay at home and i'm not sure it's a good thing by the way but i'm just saying that that's that's what's happening um yeah, particularly yeah. around travel i mean when you think with the travel industry ever get back to normal when you think of taking a 12-hour flight or somewhere for a meeting then the cost of you know the reward and effort kind of gets rebalanced a little bit. And, and I can do all the, the, most of the stuff I do on in that travel journey, you know, the training, the hard skills, the soft skills. I saw a piece of kit the other day, which is commercially available. It's not expensive called body swaps, where, you know, I can sit in a room with you and listen to your conversation and, you know, all through avatars and talk about how you're interacting with other people and then give you feedback, right? That's really mm -hmm. cool. But the really cool bit then is I swap positions with you and I watch myself give myself that feedback in an avatar. And between VR and AI, it mirrors my body language, my tone of voice. So I literally get to see myself doing my thing, right? Um, and I've seen the studies they've done on this, like one study they did with this company, three, this, will, this will make you laugh and it made me laugh. 300 people did it, right? 299 said they picked up they, something they would change, okay? And the only person who didn't say they had anything to change was a 24-year-old life coach, right? <laughs> <laughs> Says a lot about the coaching fraternity, but they, there you go. Um, but, you know, but like it will, it will have a huge impact on the need to go to work, the need to be in an office to train people, the need to be in an office to give them feedback, the need to be to socialize. Yeah, I, I, and I wouldn't underestimate, the, you know, because it's not, it's no longer the technology of the future, it's the technology of now. And suddenly it will explode and everybody will go, my God, where did that come from? Um, but over the next five years, it's going to have a huge impact. We can't take any more disruption. <laughs> oh, you've seen nothing yet. <laughs> I know. Uh, any other comments or anyone want to join in the conversation? Just oh, quick one there. I'm just curious, uh, just in general, um, is there a reluctance for companies to invest too much in the office space, uh, bearing in mind that there may be other variants of this COVID coming down along the line that haven't been foreseen yet? Uh, is there a kind of a reluctance to, to say, OK, COVID is done, right, back to square one, now we're back in business? Is there an element to that? No, I think there was an obvious pause in decision making, I'd say about six months ago, 
um, kind of even from last summer, there was there was um, it was very evident with companies we were dealing with that they were just taking a wait and see approach to how all this was panning out. Um, I think the vaccine rollout has really started to signal a beginning of the end, hopefully. Um, and I think now, well, particularly probably from the start of this year, really, um, people are really starting to approach strategies, kind of bearing in mind that this hopefully is the beginning of the end. So they are just kind of looking now to carry on as normal, almost drawing a line under 2020. At this stage, probably drawing a line under Q1 or H1 anyway, H1 2021, and seeing kind of the end of this year as a, a return to normality, um, with then kind of 2022 being, you know, the view of being everybody kind of being back to normal. But I haven't picked up any conversations with anyone asking about kind of different variants and other things. I think people are just kind of focusing now on vaccinations, hopefully lowering case numbers and being in a position where people can really start to, to go back to work. And equally, I mean, decisions aren't quick. Like if you're making decisions about, you know, an office, it's not going to happen tomorrow. Um, so people are really starting to think about things now, really, with, with a view to them kind of happening in kind of six months time. Yeah, and I think that's a call to action for all of us to get think get our thinking caps on and figure out what do we want this world to look like. Um, so I think we'll wrap it up there. The, the key takeaways for me that I took down were that really the future is hybrid. Uh, the liquid footprint is, is stuck in my mind now that the future is hybrid. That could mean anything. It could mean um, some days working from home. It could be one week from home, one week in the office. It could be just working from wherever. Um, or it could be just popping into the office whenever you need to have a meeting or do an innovation event. Um, and we definitely saw an end to um, the throwaway culture, right? And that um, culture of uh, more is more, where we just consume and overconsume and sweat the assets. So I definitely see a move away from um, or a move towards what markets are thoughtful capitalism. Um, and, you know, we all still need to make money, but we will do it in a more thoughtful way. Um, and the other takeaway, I think, is that experiences are key. So now that we're all, you know, in situ at home and we've had this opportunity that now we're thinking about, well, if I need to go outside, what is the experience or what is my expectation of what I expect? And some of how we show off that expectation and, and help deliver those experiences will be um, some things that we need to overcome in the future. Is there anything that you would like to add, Hannah, or anybody else? Oh, you're on mute. Sorry, <laughs> I knew I was going to do that at some stage. <laughs> Sneak it uh, in. No, just, just I agree with you. I think, you know, things have changed so much. Things were already starting to change from even kind of a technology basis. But I think the pandemic has really just catalyzed so many different things from the way we live, the way we go about work, the way we shop, the way... We socialize it's just kind of changed everything so i think um you know i have to do an outlook presentation at the beginning of every year and i always say you know i'm almost kind of optimistic with caution um and just almost to kind of expect the unexpected like this is one thing but there's always something you know yeah. there's always you know whether it's american elections or whether it's um a, a geopolitical point or the economy or you know there's always there's always external factors at play so i think just kind of keeping ahead of trends and insights is really important um keeping ahead and some of the things i've talked about is key because you know they're not just things for the future they're happening now and i totally agree with your kind of hybrid and experience point i think they're just you know and the sustainability point i was making and the technology point you know those things are just small parts of um, what we all need to really be more aware of in the future. Yeah. So thank you so much. It was great to hear from JLL. So, that. Thank you so much, Anna. I really appreciate that. And thank you.